Hey everyone, it's George Kuros. Welcome back to another season of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And first of all, happy 2024. So it is uh, wonderful that you could be back with me. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. It is wonderful to have you. We talk a lot about embracing change, innovation, education. But I also like to mix it up, talk about sports, talk about life, just talk about whatever's on my mind. Because a lot of times when we do education podcasts are so focused on just the education element but I think there's more to us as educators there's more to us as people and sometimes we complain that people just see us as teachers and don't see us as humans but then we choose not to share that human side and so to start off 2024 I brought on someone who I consider a very good friend his name is Mike Kleba um, he has a book that's been around for a while, but he just released an audio version of it called Otherful. It's a great book. Check it out uh, in the link down below. But uh, Mike and I had a great conversation, talked about, you know, really that need to create. And he made some commitments to uh, not only me, but to you on stuff that he wants to do. And as you're listening to this podcast, what I encourage you to think about is the year you want to create ahead. I... I'm I'm fussy with this stuff. I, I struggle with it all the time. And I struggle with sometimes my own personality in the sense that uh, I, I really struggle with not, I don't struggle with change. I struggle with not changing. I struggle with it, that I like to try new things. I like to really embrace opportunities and, and create them. And so as you think about the start of this year, I would love for you to listen to this podcast. I know you're going to get a lot of insights from our conversation, from Mike, but what are you going to add to this space? And what I mean by that is, what are you going to share in the comments? What are you going to create on Instagram? What are you going to post and, and think about that? Because a lot of times when we have these podcasts, it's about our focus on consuming content. But what do we create? What do we put back out in the world? Because that opportunity to create is really what's going to initiate and create those opportunities for you. So I, as much as I love that you're here, I hope to hear back from you as well. Don't just consume this stuff. Let's hear back from you. You can comment down below. Maybe even commit to something you're going to try for 2024. And if you write in the comments, there's a little bit more accountability to that. And I talk a lot about sharing some of my own goals publicly because it creates an accountability that I don't want to not achieve them when I put them out to the world that I, there's something I'm going for. So it is 2024. Welcome back to another episode and another year of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Universe Mindset Podcast for 2024. This is actually being recorded in December of 2023, but we're doing a little bit after school. So a little Innovators Mindset after hours. <laughs> there it goes. There goes my monetization on YouTube, which I don't get anyway. But a little totally, worth, totally worth it. I'm here with my buddy, Mike Kleba, and Mike and I, we're going to do a real short podcast. Welcome you to 2024. So, hey, listen, I might change the theme music this year, but I ain't changing this. <laughs> Welcome to 2024. Let's go. So, uh, Mike is actually the co-author of the wonderful book called Otherful and How to Change the World and Your School Through Other People. He wrote that with Ryan O'Hara. I actually just kind of mix you guys up sometimes. I just call you Mike O'Hara. I don't know why I do that. <laughs> I don't mind. All right. Brian's yeah. a good one to be confused with. Yeah. And so uh, I actually had Mike on podcast. Jeez, I don't know. When I lived in Canada, I was like, now it's a couple of years ago. And we've been become very good friends since. Like basically <laughs> anyone who comes on my podcast, you could become, we become friends. And it's not because you want to. It's because I'm just going to start bugging you, I guess. Is that what kind That's of true. I can vouch for that. Can vouch for <laughs> that. Of what happened. So um, not only did uh, Mike actually write this wonderful book, and it is now, you can actually get the audio version too. So let, let's hear a little bit of your voice, Mike. Let's hear the little after hours, the Innovators Mindset Podcast after hours. Let's hear your voice. You know, if you're an administrator out there and you're looking for new opportunities and thoughts about how to interact with teachers, oh, yeah. give other full a try. How'd, that, how'd uh, I do? That was wonderful. And that's exactly how it reads the entire book. Oh yeah, it's it's velvet. It's butter. Love it's it. like butter. No, it actually is. It's a great. It's a great audio book, and the people who are listening to it are loving it. We have sound effects. It's really well designed. It's a short read. It's like three and a half hours long. It's like a podcast, 
but it's a book. It's pretty good. You know, so we were talking about this before the podcast. One of the things that I, I, I actually listen to books all the time when I'm running and I, there's, there's a, it is like a running for me is like a, like a moving meditation. Right. Mm. And I, I have learned a lot. One of the things I started doing that's kind of weird is it maybe this, does this sound weird? If I get a really good idea, I can't write and run. I'm terrified. So I'll actually grab my phone and I'll record myself talking about the book or something that stuck with me. And then I'll come back and I'll like, cause, cause by the time I get home, I'll forget about it. Right. So that, that's something. the same way. I'm so exactly the same way. So you can actually check out, um, other full, we're going to talk a little bit about it. The one thing I really appreciate you about, about you, Mike, that you are currently, what, what is your, I know you teach, what is your current teaching position? So I'm teaching ninth grade honors English and 12th grade AP literature. I'm also teaching a film class that's a co-seated class with freshmen in college with uh, Stony Brook University here on Long Island. Oh. Well, hey, and, and shout out to Long Island. Let's go Islanders. Let's, all right. Let's go Islanders. All right. So the, the thing that I really appreciate about Mike, and we were talking about this before, is he actually talks a lot. And I want to, I don't necessarily, kind of leadership, I want to say that too. But also, like, I want to say specifically administrators, because I would actually say as a teacher, um, you are an incredible leader and you have a lot of influence with other people. And I think a lot of times when people say leadership, they think of people in admin positions, but I know people who are admin positions, let's be honest, are not great leaders. And I know people that are not in admin positions who are incredible leaders, but I think sometimes you really specifically talk about what you hope for as an educator from administrators and some of the things that you see, but I do appreciate and this is really important to me that you don't do it in a way where you are necessarily condescending because I think there's elements of leadership and administration that you can have an understanding of, but unless you do the position, there's some ins and outs that you wouldn't understand. It's the same, like teachers don't like being told how to teach by someone who's never taught. Let's be honest. Teachers don't like being taught, told how to teach by someone who has taught. Right. And it's, yeah. And so I, I've always approached it from, I'm just sharing ideas with you. You got to figure out your solutions because I don't know your kids. I don't know your context, but you do that in a really good way. It, like, are you cognizant of that? How do you kind of go through that approach of really kind of, you know, sharing some insights about administration, even though you're doing it from the role of a teacher? Yeah. Um, first of all, everyone wants to be seen and acknowledged for what they're good at and what they know. And the, the converse is true as well. We, we don't want to be told how to do anything by people who don't do what we do. And this is why when you find out somebody does what you do, if you, let's say you've got, you know, two daughters and a son, you meet somebody else with two daughters and a son. Right. And you're like, oh, OK, we, I mean, we, we get this. We know what this is like together. And and I think that um, in education, we at, in, entirely educators, admin, staff, we all suffer from a large cultural belief that anyone can tell us how to do our job. Like that's something that we can all kind of cling together on. Like whether you're a principal or you're a teacher, you've met somebody in the grocery store who thinks they know how to do your job better than you. So that already doesn't feel great. From my perspective, I've been a teacher now for almost 25 years. Um, I have been interested in teacher leadership from the beginning, but and I'm going to do the biggest uh, compliment I give to administrators. I think, um, the job has always intimidated me to become an administrator. You know, I can if I want to. And I think early on in my career, I would say things like, ah, I don't want to become an admin. I mean, that's like going to the dark side. No, nah. it's actually, I, I totally see it a different way, especially after doing this work. Great administrators, great leaders in education. I think they're the most important leaders in any field anywhere. The, the impact that they have, the, the ripple effect, if you will, through their teachers and then through their students, it's massive. So... You know, when Ryan O'Hara and I uh, put together, you know, the ideas of this book and we started working on it together, we actually realized that at least one of us had to become an administrator or it would be just a, an act of hypocrisy to write this book. Right. I mean, the only thing we could say is and, and I do say this to people is like, well, I can tell you what it's like to be a teacher under administrators. And I think there's some really valuable info, info to that. We could probably come back around to it if we want to, George. Um, but what Ryan and I wanted to do is what would happen if an administrator and a teacher wrote something together? And I still don't see this happening anywhere. I mean, I see people who've left the classroom work right. together, but 
I am, I mean, I literally taught the last few pages of Cormac McCarthy's The Road today. We're reading Antigone in my ninth grade class. That happened today before I talked to you. Right. And so what I'm trying to bring is the side of the conversation, which is on the receiving end of what administrators do. But I have to tell you, I don't think there's a tougher job in the game, like a superintendent, a principal of a, of a school that's got a lot going on with a real diverse community. There's not a harder job in education. There's not much of a harder job in leadership. So I have a lot of respect for people who do admin, and I hope that comes through with my work because, to tell you the truth, um, a great leader in a school literally can change the world in a way that a teacher can, but with such a bigger impact, you know? Well, because you, you know, as an administrator, you affect all the teachers that affect the kids, right? Like I, I, and it's, it's interesting you say this because uh, we, Allison Apps and I just put together a book called What Makes a Great Principal. And we share our insights, you know, from uh, being principals. And even in the beginning, one of the things I shared that was really important to me, I didn't want to write the book because I thought I was a great principal. I wrote the book because I had a great principal. And I knew how much of an impact it made on me. And like it, it, it not only just changed my thoughts on education, it, it literally changed my life. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, you know, and I'm proud because you said, I haven't really seen anything like this because except for now it's coming out is our book actually isn't just sharing this insights from principals. We ask teachers and students to talk about really effective principles, what made them effective and actually really kind of what like give people strategies because a lot of times we say you know we got to really hear from the people we serve but then those books actually come from kind of a top-down approach but i'm like no, no no let's hear from the people we serve and when we were going through that process we have um 15 people writing chapters um on these five pillars and you were uh probably the, actually you were the first person i thought of and hmm. it's weird because i didn't i don't and we have incredible people. Um, but I, I just know your work really intimately. And, and it was kind of funny because as we were talking here today, I was like, now I know why. Because just how you talk about it, Ben, but you don't do it in a condescending way. Because, you know, when someone says, oh, it's how you make the big bucks. It's like, okay, well, I guess it's okay. I feel crappy. Like, you know, do you know what I mean? Like, it, it's, not, it's, it's not really helping anybody. And I, I've always tried to talk about how you lead up. Like, sometimes you do have a crappy administrator. Mm -hmm. And... That's a reality. Like I'm not pretending you don't, but yeah. just saying they're crappy and then being miserable, it's not helping anything. How do you actually help lead up? And so can you just talk a little bit about what you shared in that chapter as a little preview? Um, you know, cause that, cause that was, it was weird. Cause I was like, oh, that's why I asked them, but I didn't really figure it out. It was like kind of, you know, just kind of in my brain, but then I, yeah, it was cool. I was really glad that you asked me to be a part of it. And, um, you know, the the idea that we can approach talking about school from various stakeholder positions isn't just important because diversity is important, although it is. And it's not just important because it gives us a more of a 360 uh, understanding of what's going on in schools, although that is important. What's great about it is you get to see, you know, what we call the, the web, which is the entanglement of like the impact of all of these different positions, you know, uh, a principal. Uh, and his or her or their effect on their teachers, it's a, um, it can be really big. It can also be not very big. It depends on the person. It depends the way the school's laid out. So for me, the approach was, well, can I really dig into some school leaders I've had and think about their direct impact on me? Because the mission of the book, as you told me about it, George, and of course what Allison told uh -huh. me in some emails as well, is you know we want to uh, equip principals um, especially aspiring principals, but principals who are who are already at the gig, with really rich and useful practical data, like yeah. and data as in qu like qualitative, in, like yeah. qualitative data, like stories, anecdotes, and then like best practice kind of like stuff you might not know. And so what I wrote about, um, I wrote about two principles. Um, one is a principal that I learned from. So she was less my principal and more a graduate. Uh, teacher that I had for a number of semesters uh, who just blew my mind. And she, what she taught me more than anything was how important it is to know your budget and your contract. Now, this sounds boring as heck, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the boring part, but I'm going to tell it in a wonderful way. That's yeah, the beauty yeah. of it. Because I was, yeah. I remember saying to you, this is, a, this is kind of can be a boring topic. So yeah. we need your, we need your yeah. charm. 
Yeah, and what and what I did is I I just dialed into um and uh, you know and Dr. Monica Virgefield, she's an incredible uh person, like a, a titan in New York State education. She's a really big deal, and I'm really fortunate that I got to work with her. What she said basically is, look, if you're looking for money, and we always are, right? You need to fund programs. You wanna you wanna change anything? I mean, anybody who's been a principal knows is all about the money. Like, show me the money. Like, you wanna do anything? It costs money, and usually you got to rob from Peter to pay Paul. She's like, look, the money's there if you just look hard enough. That's what you have to do. Is you've got to be relentless in your looking. You don't have to be relentless knocking on doors. She goes, that helps. It helps right. to follow up with people, but really. You have to know that there's always money stuffed away somewhere that can be repurposed. You can use it for a year and then return it, right? And you can work out deals and then you have to prove your point. And she was kind of, right. I love, she's kind of like a market person. She's like, and if your program doesn't work, it should fail. And I love that because I think we need to I do that, that more in education. Like right. in education, we need more of that. Like if it's not working, it should fail. And not because it should punish anybody, but because we want great stuff and great stuff. It either sings or it doesn't, baby. You know what I mean? This this bear dances or it doesn't. If it doesn't, Dan, sit it down, you know? There's always money in the banana stand. You know that one? <laughs> yes. Uh, that's awesome. Go. That's the first um, thing. So There's always money in the banana stand. The the uh, the other principal is a principal I currently have, um, Eric Contreras, who is also a kind of a big deal in New York. Yeah, shout, shout Contreras. That dude is for real. He was principal at Stuyvesant High School, which is arguably the best high school in New York City, which is not a small thing to say. Uh, best public school in, in New York City. It's a massive program under his tutelage. They really build out their computer science program. He's a real rock star. He also like led the charge on the complete revamp of social studies instruction for 1.2 million students in, wow. in New York. So like, you know, he's a real player and he's done, he sat on a couple blue ribbon commissions with some really big deal people. And he's our principal now. I like, how did he come out to my little school, North shore schools, North shore schools, by the way, is a killer school district. I am so delighted to be here. Um, you've been out here a couple of times, George, come back. We'd love to have you. Um, anyway, here's what Eric did. Um, Eric, as a new principal, he helped me um, basically run the theater program in the first year of COVID. This guy took over the job first year of COVID. Like he stepped in in fall of 2020. And what Eric taught me is if you build relationships first and make it the first and always goal to build and maintain relationships, you can do just about anything in school. Right. And and those relationships, when you say build relationships, he means know about people's families, know about how people are feeling, actually ask them how they're doing. Listen, remember, um, get a bite to eat with people when you can stop and have a conversation about life. Just listen. Don't give any feedback. So these are the things I wrote in the book. Like, you know, I think a principal who sees that it's like at the top of their job is to be like the relationship meister who gets along with everybody in some way or another. You don't get along with everybody, but you got to kind of get along with everybody when you're principal. Um, that really hit me, you know, and I think that a lot of principals could probably stand to hear that. I mean, again, I'm not a principal, but it was great to share their stories. Well, the, you know, and this is something I've I I really believe. And I'm sure you probably kind of along the same lines. I believe you can build a culture in a school, but I also believe a culture can be dependent upon a person. And what Absolutely. I mean by that, if you have a great administrator and they build this a wonderful culture and they leave and a, a crappy one comes in, <laughs> it can be it's right, over. right away. And like people are like, instantly, Oh, we want to build a culture. So we're not there. No, it actually culture is built on people. And especially to be honest with you, the people that actually have authority too can really change a lot of things. And I, you know, I'm, I'm known for my work in innovation, but I also mm. will say this forever. I also don't want to get in trouble. I don't want, I'm not that ask forgiveness, uh, you know, before permission guy. No, I want right. to know that you're backing me up. And if you, if I don't feel you're backing me up and this is a lot of teachers see this. If they see somebody else not backed up trying new things, then they're like, oh, I'm not even gonna bother asking, right? And exactly. so there is there is a real, I think that's why it's so important um, in what you talk about. So let's, let's actually, and you, you do really dig deep into this and other full, really talking about leadership. Um, can I ask you, and this is maybe kind of putting you on the spot. What is different? Because I there's a little bit different for me. What is different about the audiobook version versus the written book? And you had a little time 
since, right? Like you didn't, it yeah. wasn't one after another. So like what, what, if I'm picking up the audiobook, what am I getting different than if I picked up the written book? That's a great question. Well, I mean, first of all, I think what you get is our dulcet tones, our sweet voices <laughs> in your ears. Right. That's what I was um, looking for actually the answer. Uh, well, what uh, are now, the tones of voices? Are they warm? Yeah. I kind of think. Uh, well, so, so, uh, and I just love to say this because I think it's really cool that it's true. Uh, Ryan and I both have graduate degrees in theater, and that isn't to flex. It is to say we both yeah. at some point in our lives cared enough about performance that we actually dedicated a serious amount of time to it. Um, he has a BFA in acting, which is basically the highest degree you can get in acting. And I have a master's of theater, and I got it to, to, to direct. And the reason why I'm saying that at this point is we really thought about a, something that would be nice in your ear you know like some audiobooks just sound pretty wooden this right. does not um and we and like i said we designed it through with sound um and with a real sense of pace so i think it's you know the the what we've heard back from people is people really like it and we're like trickling it out on social media here on instagram linkedin tiktok etc uh facebook we're in all those places and and it's been really fun to share that but i think the biggest thing you're going to get when you listen to other full um, because I've been listening to it and I got a chance to listen to the whole book last week for the first time, like straight through. I just was like, you know, what, Mike do this. That's cool. Um, yeah. What you get, I think more than anything is the opportunity to do something else while you're thinking about leadership. Now you brought up when you, you know, when you love to listen to audiobooks. I think that there's a, a phenomenon that happens when we listen to audiobooks and we're walking or yeah. riding in our car. And I think it's, we go into like a deeper state of thought. Yeah. It's kind of a, a you know, and, and some, sometimes people refer to this as kind of like a quasi theta space where you kind of actually lose track of time. This is why sometimes if you really listen to a good audiobook and you're driving like an hour long commute feels like it's just flying by. And this is true with reading as well, but I think audiobooks tap into something deeper. I think it's part of the reason why podcasts have blown up. So I think that honestly, the biggest thing is that you can like, you know, like I was making soup yesterday and I was listening to a couple of our chapters and I'm like, this just allows me to dig into this in a different way than if I were reading it. It feels less academic. It feels more personal. It feels a lot more deep. It feels like it reaches into things. And I, and I think it does, you know, Ryan and I invite people in this book, like whatever we write in here that doesn't agree with you, because no leadership book has got right. all the answers. Every leadership book, it's like one book works for one person. Another book works for another person. You know, whatever doesn't work for you, toss it. Whatever does work for you, mix it up with your stuff. And George, I hear you say this. It's like, we're not experts on anything that you're not experts on. We, we're experts on our own perspective. We're experts on our own take on things. But whatever in this that works for you, mix it up with whatever works for you and make it your own. Because we're all just sharing ideas anyway, right? Everybody's copying and pasting all their ideas in the first place. That's what it comes down to. That's what being a professional is. So here's what I'm going to challenge people to listen to this to. If you pick up the audio book or you, you know, Mike does some previews on his Instagram, on his TikTok. Mm -hmm. Those will be listed down below. Mike's big, he's doing dances and stuff. Hey, uh, just a little, just a little aside here. Um, for people who don't know what a BFA is. Uh, just so you know, I kind of went through like, what is a BFA? And there's a lot of acronyms and it took me a while. I was just so you know, I don't know. <laughs> like BFA, that was that slang. Oh, that bachelor of fine arts. I'm assuming <laughs> that yeah, I guess it could, it could have meant a lot of different things. I yeah. Guess. Yeah. I went in, I went in a lot of different directions. I'm like, did he just swear without swearing? So <laughs> as, I, I will be school swears. That. Yeah. But like, Hey, this is, I'm, I'm a big pause guy on podcasts. Right. Mm. So I pause. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. And then I'll write something down. The Here's how I challenge people listening to this. And this is, hey, 2024, brand new year. If you take the ideas that Mike shares and Ryan share uh, in this, make an Instagram video. Say like, hey, I heard this, do this. Connect with Mike on either of those platforms. And I, I guarantee you he'll reach out back, back out to you. Because that's when stuff really hits you. That's when you actually make, like, that's the thing. And I don't, I, I, I'm teaching a class with UPenn right now. Mm. And one of the things that really makes me happy is someone. So part of the reading is my own book. So the course is based on the book I wrote with Katie Novak. And one of the things that I, and people know, I love this. They'll take something I wrote in the book and they'll say, Hey, this is great for this, but I'm not doing this. I'm doing that. So here's the modification. I'm like, Oh yes. That's the whole point of the innovators mindset is taking the ideas and then just kind of restructuring them to make them work for you. Not, 
hey, you, got, you use my idea, you're going to give me credit. That's not the point. The point is to take the idea, really kind of create something. Like, I'm not saying it's better than my stuff, but I am saying it's better for you mm. in your context when you make it. That's the whole point. So I challenge you with that. All right, this is the last thing I'm going to ask you. Because we spent like an hour and a half, like not recording. So <laughs> it's true. 2024, the, you know, big thing for me is I always try to challenge myself with new things. Um, I, like I, I'm a big believer that if I'm in the same place at the beginning of 2024 or at the end of 2024, where I started, then it wasn't a good year. Mm. I always try to like push myself to new things. What's something that you want to maybe push yourself into doing? And maybe I'm kind of calling you out. Maybe I'm, you know, maybe kind of putting you on the spot. Something you might try. Something I love it. Great. <laughs> Something um, that might be available as of this podcast. <laughs> um, well, I, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I see where you're going. You're going? Is um, going? Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> well, 2024 is the year that I start a newsletter. Um, hey, you know, let's go. Uh, it, <laughs> and 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 here's why. I have things to share that I've learned that may be useful for some people. And that's the deal. And, and I think a lot of people, and I'll, I'll put myself at the top of this list. Um, and I want to say this to any of the listeners out there who are working on anything, or you, you think you've got something of value to share. Well, what the heck we need you to share it. You see, like think of life as one big dark cavern and all of us have a tiny little flashlight, right? And your tiny little flashlight points at things and my tiny little flashlight points at things. The thing is, if I see something that you can't see with your flashlight and I think it might be able to help you, then I'm doing you a great service. If I actually say, hey, listen, this is what I've found. And if you, with your flashlight, share what you've been finding with me and it's, it's valuable to me, maybe it's something I really needed to hear. And I think about, George, your book, you know, Innovator's Mindset, I think about, we were talking about um, James Clear, Atomic Habits a little bit before, mm -hmm. and we've, t we've talked about a hundred books together. Uh, you know, what is a book, but somebody saying, listen, I mean, obviously there are some people who, who write the books and they say, I'm the expert and you should know right. everything that I know. But I think the best books, the most approachable books are kind of like, Hey, listen, this is what I've found. And I think it could be really valuable for you. And if it's valuable for you, great. And if it isn't, that's also great. Uh, share it with somebody who might be valuable. With. And that's what I think about with the newsletter. You know, what pieces do I continue to learn? Because I continue to learn new things. Um, Ryan and I are uh, finishing our second book, which we're going to also launch in 2024. So that's another thing that we're that that I want to say I'm going to put out there for 2024. And that whole book is about paradox and leadership, about how you need to be able to hold conflicting frames in your head at the same time. You need to be able to put up with two different conflicting ideas and be able to honor both, not just put up with them, but honor both. Um, see the strength in different perspectives and, and, and then extract that strength and build off of that strength. So I mean, do you know the, the yeah. paradoxical commandments? Do you know that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my research of this I, book, has, I literally just blogged about that yesterday. It's so cool, right? It's, it's, it's very good. It, there's just a lot of richness in it. I mean, we might just call your capacity to understand paradox wisdom. Because, you know, when you're young and when you're starting with something, you get you have really clear ideas of how everything should be. It should be this way. It shouldn't be that way. You know, the, the tyranny of consistency, we talk about it in our in, in other full, you know, you get caught up in the idea of like, listen, we figured out how this works. Keep it simple, stupid. If it ain't broke. And there's some truth to that. But there's also some massive blind spots in keep it simple, stupid, because some things actually aren't simple. And the attempts to make them simple make you misunderstand it, you know? Um, sometimes if it ain't broke, um, it still is broken. It just doesn't look like it's broken because you're not paying attention to it. So at any rate, um, those are two things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw one other one because I want it to be on this podcast and I want it, I want Accountability. it to you because I know what you're doing. Accountability. Um, I'm running a marathon in 2024. Let's and it'll go. Be my, Let's go. It'll be, um, and it'll be my third. Um, and it'll be my third in three decades uh, because... Uh, I'm trying to run one in every decade, at least one. I I run 10Ks and I run halves and stuff like that, but I haven't run in well, over Do you know which one you're going to do? You're just you're going to do one. Have, haven't picked. Um, if you've got an idea or anybody's got an idea, I'm willing to travel. In fact, I'm excited to go somewhere to run. The New York City Marathon was a religious experience. George, I cannot I cannot encourage you enough to run the New York City Marathon. You, marathons right now. Dude. Yeah, I got one coming up and is is all about it. Well, it's really yeah. What, which one are you doing? Because I know you just did the half. You just did a half. You know, it was, 
Yeah. And that was the, the half was like, uh, you know, so the, the you every, killed it too. You ran the heck out of that thing. Listen, listen, it almost killed me. And the yeah, point of the half marathon was, is part of my training towards the full and like people, when you're doing this, like uh, I've said this forever because I've run marathons. Uh, I ran when I was 29 and ran when I was 30 and now I'm 48. So this is pushing it. Well, this is a big distance between them. Uh, you and I are the same on this, dude. I ran one when I was 26. I ran one when I was 39. And I want to run one when I'm 49. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah, you're running on time because before that decade's up, right? Yeah. So I actually, weird, weird side story. I was running. It was really hot. I took some Gatorade. I've never drank Gatorade. And I almost mm -hmm. died. Like, it was like, because yeah. my stomach wasn't ready for it. Right? And I have, yeah. I, we were talking about this before. I have a terrible stomach. Yeah. And it almost killed me. But the whole premise of doing... The race, that race was to actually go through some of the failures to go, no, okay, when I do the marathon, do not drink Gatorade. It was, I didn't want to just show up. And so like little things like that are really yeah. important to kind of go through Cause you, I, the thing I love about a marathon, it's not running the marathon. It's the, the training. Cause you learn about yourself. Like you learn how disciplined you are, how you keep up with your habits, things like that. And really. Um, it is a powerful thing. I'm going to build on something you said, and I'm, I'm glad you're starting that newsletter we were talking about before, because I, I think you have such great insights to share. Um, for anyone who's like, well, I don't have anything of value. There's a really great video. I'll share in the link down below. It's all, it's by Derek Sivers. I think is the name I've shared it forever. It's called obvious to you, amazing to others. So I think one of the things you do really well, you just kind of share your insights and you're open to people taking them for what they are. But some of the things that are just natural to us, just come to us, are mind blowing to other people. And it's the same thing for other people. And so I never, ever believe I have something of value to share. I just share my learning. And if you find value in it, great. But I'm not like, they're like, hey, you should read my blog because I know everything. It's like, no, that's not why I do it. Here's some things I'm learning. If you pick up something from it, great. That's the whole okay. mentality of that. And I feel it just, even saying that, it kind of lets you off the hook. Because if you say you're an expert, then you can be attacked like one, right? But if you're just like, I'm just sharing my learning. So it's like, oh, that's stupid. Well, oh, thanks for letting me know. What was stupid about it? Right? I, I, you I, I, love, I love the way you put that, man. I think that's really great. I'm going to totally borrow that and, and credit you for it. Because I think that's what's, what's beautiful about saying, you know, I don't have something valuable. What I have is I have what I've learned and maybe it's valuable to you. That little slight little adjustment, that does two Take things that are really powerful. Yeah. Pressure. Well, you're covering that part. I'm not going to talk about that part because you're right. You've nailed that part. It takes the pressure off of you. But I think it does two other really important things. One, it says to your listener, I'm humble enough to recognize that you have your own perspective on things and I'm not here to usurp or override that. And that's powerful. We talk about this in other full. One of the most important things you can do, and I've learned this as a teacher, and I, I believe it's applicable to leadership as well. Um, the one of the most important things you can do is just acknowledge that somebody else is going through their own everything. And everything that they're going through is important and meaningful to them. And that I don't need to do anything to it to make it meaningful. It's already meaningful. What I can do is acknowledge it and honor and respect that it's happening. So that's the first thing when you say, maybe maybe this could be valuable to you there's a there's a humility in that that says to the people i know that your stuff is important the second thing and i think it's equally valuable is you're saying to somebody i'm also open to correction and when we say i'm open to correction and actually george you know i don't know if you saw this you know because you have to read a zillion books from people that you you know are either mentoring like me or people that you just get inbounds from i'm sure you read a ton of books and maybe you don't read them uh, all like every word, but I actually quote you another full. And one of the things I say, I forget which chapter it is exactly, but I say, um, you know, sometimes leadership is going first. Yep. And when, and when you go first in saying I could be wrong or I could have to amend this because maybe I'll get new information, you model for everybody else. You basically make it okay to fix yourself. And one of the biggest problems that happens among teachers, now I can talk about teachers, I won't talk about admin when I say this, although it might apply, and if it does, check it out. But when I see a teacher who can't be corrected by his or her students, I'm like, 
yo, man, you're just leaving money on the table here because your students already know that you think you're all that. They already know that you're not in a two way dialogue with them. And students want to collaborate. It doesn't matter if they're seven or if they're 17. They want to collaborate on their learning. And the more they own it, the more they get from it. And we rob people of their ability to own stuff when we claim that we're the experts, when we claim we've got some sort of position on it. So I really appreciate how you put that. And I'm going to start using it, man. I think it's great. I love it. I love it. Well, hey, everyone that's listening, check out Otherful. Also, it's 2024, brand new year. We're running marathons. We're writing Let's newsletters. So right, I right to, books. actually, if you've made it this far, tell us what you're going to try this year. Put some accountability in the comments down on YouTube or, um, you know, hit Mike or myself up on Instagram. We'd love to learn from you too, because I think it's, you know, when you're, you kind of put stuff out there It's one of the reasons, like, I don't tell people I'm running a marathon to brag about it. I'm telling it so I make sure I do it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's scary. But, it is terrifying, but like, I can't, I can't do it. I got, I got to do everything I can now, right? Like I, if I'm in, like, if I'm injured, I won't, but yeah, gonna, sure. it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. I know it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt, man. We can do it. We can do it. And then, and we'll be accountability buddies, man. That's what we do. Love it. All right. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for staying after school. You taught all day and then you hung out with me and hang out with everybody. I hope you have an amazing start to 2024. Mike couldn't have asked of anybody better to start off the year with. So thanks for taking time with me. Thanks, George. It was a real treat, man. I love talking to you. Best of luck to you and best of luck to everybody out there. 2024. Wait, what do you mean beautiful. best of luck to me? You're not going to talk to me after this? Are we not? No. Uh, no we're, is we're this, just shouting, is, is this a circular things, moment? moment? Is this a circular moment? This like, is it. This is our last moment? time, man. This All is right. a special uh, last time. I wish you the best and uh, <laughs> have a good life. <laughs> you too, man. You too. I hope to good see luck. you there. Good luck with everything. <laughs> well, I, I love saying good luck. I think it's great. Yeah, this is not goodbye. It's just I'll never see you again. Yeah, it's just farewell. <laughs> All right, everyone. Have a great 2024. Thanks for listening. Mike, thanks for being on. Appreciate you, brother. Love thanks. You. All right, Love you too, baby.